All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm John Gellies. I'm the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division of the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLE Eye Center for Keratoconus. This morning, we're going to go ahead and talk about keratoconus and really what you need to know about diagnostics, cross-linking, and scleral lenses. So I'll hop right in here and uh, give you a little background on keratoconus, okay? So keratoconus is a progressive corneal disease, which is characterized by a loss of biomechanical strength. This loss of strength results in focal thinning, steepening, and irregular corneal topography. It's a bilateral, asymmetric, and clinically non-inflammatory disease that typically begins in puberty age until about the fourth decade of life, where it tends to stop progressing. The prevalence in the United States has been classically reported as one in 2,000 individuals. However, this was reported as of 1986 in a Kennedy study, which used classical forms of instrumentation to diagnose keratoconus, such as slit lamp findings, uh, scissor reflex on retinoscopy, as well as keratometry on an old school keratometer. So worldwide, data most recently has suggested that the prevalence of keratoconus is more like 1 in 375 individuals and even as little as 1 in 191 individuals. Now, those studies came out of the Netherlands and New Zealand, respectively, but the differences here in those numbers are attributed to advanced diagnostic instrumentation that was not available before. So we all know the progressive visual impact of keratoconus. Now these individuals being shown here all have their lower order aberrations corrected. However, you can see that the impact is really in the amount of higher order aberrations, which is distorting the vision. And as the disease gets more severe, so do the higher order aberrations, causing more visual degradation. Now we all know the advanced slit lamp signs that we see with keratoconus, things like Vox striae, apical scarring, apical thinning, Fleischer's rings, and in uh, situations where the decimase tears, we end up with high drops. Now, the traditional management of keratoconus in the United States has always been to diagnose the disease when subjective or objective findings are presented, and then visually manage the individuals with corneal gas permeable lenses to improve the visual quality. Now, knowing that we couldn't do anything to stop the progression of the disease, what we did was just continuously change the gas permeable lens to accommodate the more advanced keratoconic shape. And if complications arose that may result in advanced scarring or contact lens intolerance, we would go to the treatment of last resort, which is a penetrating keratoplasty. Now, rates of penetrating keratoplasty in the literature have been classically reported as anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, depending on uh, the source. And what they found in the CLEX study specifically was that there were risk factors that were associated with needing a penetrating keratoplasty, such as being diagnosed with keratoconus at a younger age, uh, steeper keratometric values, and worse visual acuity, as well as the other findings that you see there. So there's been a paradigm shift in the way that we manage keratoconus in the United States. As of 2016, we now have an FDA-approved device and drug to be able to do the cross-linking procedure within the United States. Now, the phase three clinical trials were started in 2008. Uh, the medical monitor was the doctor that I work with, Dr. Peter Hirsch, uh, and the FDA approval came in 2016 for patients with progressive keratoconus and corneal ectasia following refractive surgery. Now, in the study, the most reverse, excuse me, the most adverse um, or most common adverse events were related to epithelial removal, which the most of those resolved within the first month. Now, there was transient corneal haze shown, and that is really a poorly named opacity in the study. However, this resolves over time all the way up to about the 12 month period of time where it can return to about baseline. And you can see that haze here. You can see at the very top being the pre-op, the uh, middle there, or excuse me, the second from the top being the, uh, the one month, the three month after that, the six month and the 12 month. And you can see how the six month and the 12 month, that haze has significantly reduced. Um, now in the post-market surveys here, we found that the uh, uh, Vidro CXL system uh, has demonstrated safety and performance in line with the FDA approval, lab uh, the FDA approved labeling. 
So in the United States, this has really changed the way that we manage keratoconus. It really puts the emphasis on diagnosing the disease as early as possible, slowing and halting the disease with corneal collagen cross-linking, then doing visual rehabilitation, whether by surgical or contact lens means to improve the visual acuity, and in many cases, a combination of the two, and then afterwards to monitor the disease very often, as this is a progressive disease. Now, we want to keep our modern forms of corneal transplant, such as DALC and PK, to, again, our treatment of last resort. So corneal collagen crosslinking really puts the emphasis on early diagnosis, and we really need to lower our threshold for working up these patients and use a combined data approach to be able to diagnose this earlier and to monitor the individuals for progression. As you can see here in those scans, we can see the irregularities shown in the Hartman Shack as well as the Placido uh, Myers, as well as on the Shine Plug and the OCT. So what are the sort of red flags that we should look for to decide that we should work up or refer a patient? Well, we want to look at the family history. Obviously, a family history of keratoconus, we want to work that individual up with at least a corneal topography and any sort of correlated disease, such as atopic disease. Now, in the exam, we may find distortion of Myers on keratometry, high or high refractive sill on uh, autorefraction, uh, or we may find scissor reflux on uh, retinoscopy. Now, steep Ks, we're looking for a value of greater than uh, 48 diopters or three diopters of corneal sill being present to be able to say, hey, we should probably work this up. Also, anisometropia, uh, specifically in the cylinder component, that has been found in our practice to be a pretty significant factor, as well as high astigmatism in the, uh, against the rule or oblique positions. Again, we've found in early studies in our practice that that seems to be correlated with keratoconus as well, and a change in refractive cylinder or access. Now, the most obvious one is that we want to work up these individuals if we're not able to correct them to 2020 and we have no uh, obvious disease present. So the more of these risk factors that we have, there may be a higher risk associated with them, and we need to go ahead and use our diagnostic equipment appropriately. And if we don't have the proper diagnostic equipment, we may want to refer these individuals so, so that they can be worked up. So we want to diagnose and monitor often. So when we're looking at diagnosing the early clinical signs, early keratoconus is invisible on slit lamp exam. So this individual does have keratoconus. Um, it's easy to miss it, and the vision is usually very correctable in early keratoconus. But we really need advanced diagnostic instruments to find that, uh, those early findings. So you can see that's actually the to corneal topography, or rather tomography, of the individual that was shown there in the slit lamp. And you can see the early keratoconic signs with the absence of slit lamp findings. So we really want to use our diagnostic equipment to be able to come up with the ability to diagnose these early keratoconics as early as possible. So we all know the types of uh, curvature maps that we may see. So up on the uh, upper left of this tomography scan, we can see a classical ap or, excuse me, axial curvature map. And what we can see is on the left, we have the normal cornea, and on the right, we have the keratoconic cornea. And what we can see is the classic steepening of the keratometric value here. On the curvature, we're looking at values of greater than 48 diopters to indicate that that individual may have keratoconus, as well as other factors such as IS ratio, axis skew, uh, and uh, we want to look at mean K as well. Now, on the maps to the right, these are elevation maps. What we're doing is putting a best fit sphere through the cornea. By the research, what we're looking at is elevations of greater than 10 microns on the front surface or elevations of 15 microns on the back surface to be uh, associated with keratoconus. Now, the last map that we're going to highlight here is a pachymetric map, a global pachymetry map. And what we're able to see here is that values of under 500 microns need to be worked up or considered for keratoconus. So you can see this individual hits all of those uh, characteristics and clearly has keratoconus. Now another way to go ahead and uh, and diagnose the disease is to look at the aberration profiles of these eyes. 
Now, aberrations have been studied in Kosaki and Lim's papers back in 2007 to really say that there is a difference in the aberrations that are present in individuals with normal corneas, individuals with early keratoconus, and those individuals who have true keratoconus. And what we find is that there's an elevation specifically in coma and trefoil in these individuals, and we need to use that as a diagnostic factor of evaluating the function of the vision in these individuals. So again, here's an example from our clinic we can see a normal cornea up top, and you can see the small amount of higher order aberrations present here. The RMS value is about 0.4, which should be about normal. Now we're looking at the bottom eye, which clearly has keratoconus, and we can look at the elevated level of higher order aberrations present, specifically again in the coma factors as well as the trefoil, and we can see that that individual has an RMS of about six, and that is significantly out of the ordinary and should be helpful in diagnosing keratoconus. So we also wanna monitor often for changes in these individuals. I want you guys to start thinking of the disease more like glaucoma rather than a totally refractive disease. Both of these diseases are progressive diseases that need frequent monitoring of the structure and function. In glaucoma, we may be looking at the optic nerve and the OCT of the optic nerve to be able to look at our structure of our eye as well as the, the angle of the, uh, of the eye as well. However, we also want to use visual fields to be able to monitor the visual function. Now, when we look at keratoconus, we're looking at the structure as well, both the curvatures, elevations, and thickness of the eye, but also looking at the aberrations on the eye to be able to evaluate those individuals over time. Now, it's important to continue monitoring after treatment in these individuals. Just like an individual that would undergo a MIGS procedure in glaucoma, we wouldn't stop monitoring that individual just because they've had that treatment. The same goes for keratoconus. Just because an individual has had corneal collagen cross-linking doesn't mean that we shouldn't follow them. So, when we're documenting progression of an individual, what sort of changes are we looking for? Well, the following that we see here, any change to uncorrected visual acuity, best corrected spectacle visual acuity, refraction, slit lamp findings, keratometry, uh, topographies and K-max, and uh, corneal thickness. Now, it's really important to document these changes because the insurance companies that, out, that are out there will differ in, uh, differ in criteria that they use to diagnose or rather to, uh, to document progression of an individual. Now, there's a variety of different insurance coverages and insurance, or excuse me, and Avidro and uh, Glaucos now uh, have worked very diligently to go ahead and provide a, uh, a resource for both patients and doctors to be able to look at the various commercial plans out there. Now, we're gonna go ahead and discuss uh, corneal collagen cross-linking itself and how it works to slow or halt the progression of the disease. So we want to look at how corneal collagen cross-linking really works. So essentially what this is is a photochemical reaction uh, within the, corne the corneal stroma and the collagen. So what we're using is a riboflavin in the form of a fotrexa. And what we do from there is we go ahead and apply, once the cornea is totally saturated, UV light. And with the combination of oxygen, what we get is a, uh, a reactive oxygen species within the cornea, which creates more covalent bonds to strengthen the anterior cornea of these individuals. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking a weak structure and adding more bonding within that structure to create a stronger structure. Now, corneal collagen cross-linking is not new. It's been studied for some time. This paper was out of uh, 2007, or excuse me, <laughs> 1997, my apologies for that, uh, out of university in Dresden. Uh, Teo Seiler and his team uh, really worked on looking at many candidate agents to be able to strengthen the uh, collagen of the cornea. And what they found was that the most effective uh, was the combination of UV plus uh, riboflavin, and that was the most statistically significant for stiffening the cornea. Now, from that time, what we found is that corneal collagen cross-linking has been accepted as the worldwide uh, treatment for progressive keratoconus and corneal ectasias. And really, the uh, data coming out of uh, the international uh, stage has been able to show that the procedure is safe and effective. And if we look at this seminal paper from Dr. Seiler and his group, what we found was that the, uh, the initial findings out of this 
mirror the uh, clinical trial findings that we have in the United States. So individuals who were progressive with keratoconus would continue to progress for about a diopter and a half, and those who were treated with uh, corneal collagen cross-linking would actually flatten by about two diopters. So what are our preoperative duties? What do we need to do before a patient goes in? And what sort of expectations do we need to let the patient know about? So again, we need to establish our baselines, uh, uncorrected visual acuity, best corrected visual acuity, topography, refraction, and slit lamp findings. But there are other uh, metrics of interest, such as corneal thickness, K-max values, and corneal densitometry, which is a measure of corneal clarity. Now, we need to set our patient's expectations for this. Specifically, we need to let them know what their drop regimen is going to be after the procedure, which typically includes a, uh, all these sorts of medications that we uh, typically find in uh, other procedures where epithelial removal is involved. Uh, we want to let these individuals know that the vision will be reduced initially, sort of hazy and foggy, and that will improve after about the one month mark. And that contact lens wear can typically be resumed or started at about the one month mark. When we look at our retrospective data out of the clinic, uh, what we found is that many of these individuals are being able to wear their contact lens at the one month mark without any issues, assuming that the epithelium is smooth and illustrious, uh, which we find in most individuals. Now, <clears throat> after corneal collagen cross-linking, it's very important to remember that these patients need to be monitored because progression can occur even after uh, the cross-linking procedure. It's very rare, but it does happen. Now, what diseases can be treated under the FDA approval? We're looking at progressive keratoconus, and we're also looking at post-refractive corneal ectasias. Now, in the United States, the FDA approves uh, devices and drugs not a uh, actual procedure. So what we're looking at is the approved product according to its labeling and its indications. Now off-label use would be using the uh, system not as described, uh, meaning in individuals who may have things like pellucid marginal degeneration or ectasia after uh, RK. Now what we're looking at is unapproved uh, uses for uh, uh, instruments uh, and uh, drugs that have no label, so they have not been changed, uh, evaluated for safety and efficacy, and these use a uh, IND designation within the United States. Now, as the corneal collagen cross-linking procedure goes, we're gonna go ahead and dive into that here in a moment. <clears throat> so, what is the procedure? Essentially what we do is we make a nine millimeter epithelial debridement. We use 20% ethyl alcohol for about 30 seconds for a soak and rub. We use a Wexel sponge to go ahead and wipe away the epithelium. And in some cases, we'll go ahead and use a blunt spatula to go ahead and remove any excess epithelium that may still be adherent. Now we go ahead and uh, apply the Fotrexa viscous uh, about every two minutes, or excuse me, two drops every two minutes for 30 minutes. Uh, after this uh, period of time, what we do is we go ahead and check the corneal saturation. If the cornea is completely saturated, uh, then what we're going to do is check the corneal thickness. If we're greater than 400 microns at this point, we're going to go ahead and proceed with uh, UV illumination. However, if we're less than 400 microns, what we're going to use is the hypotonic uh, riboflavin in regular Fotrexa, and what we're going to do is cause that cornea to swell. We'll go ahead and apply this drop every 10 seconds for two minutes until that cornea swells up to the 400 micron mark. Now that also touches on a very important thing, is that many individuals who you may think are too thin for corneal collagen cross-linking, because of this ability to swell the cornea, we may be able to get them to a safe level. So it's important to go ahead and refer to the individuals who are doing your cross-linking procedure for them to evaluate whether or not they think that that individual is a good candidate based on their experience with the ability to swell the corneas. Now, once we go ahead and proceed with UV illumination, what we're doing is focusing the crosshairs on the center of the cornea, and then going ahead and giving the UV illumination and instructing the patient to look up at the UV uh, uh, diodes, and then proceeding to continue with drops every two minutes. Now, after that, what we wanna do is go ahead and hit the eye with a little ice cold BSS, uh, instill a antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory, as well as a bandage contact lens. Now, we wanna go over the post-operative expectations and what you should see in the clinic. At day one, there should be the presence of a bandage contact lens in place, as well as an underlying epithelial defect, but without gross complications. Now, this image on the upper uh, left side here 
is a one-day uh, one post-op that I remove the bandage contact lens and stain the eye just for the uh, ability to see what the defect looks like after there. Now, what we go ahead and do is wait until about day five to remove that bandage contact lens. And at this point, we want to ensure that there's no frank epithelial defects. A little bit of PEE or uh, SBK is totally fine on the cornea. Uh, at that point, we're going to go ahead and add our preservative free artificial tears at an interval of about four times a day or greater. Uh, we'll discontinue our antibiotics and our NSAID and continue on a steroid taper. Now, your taper length will depend on the, uh, the individual that you work with. Most individuals do a uh, 4 3 2, 1 or a 4 2, 1. Now, when we look at this, uh, our long-term post-op care is really looking at uh, evaluating those changes to baseline and making sure that the patient is stable or improving from there. Uh, we're looking at one month, three months, six month, and 12 month visits for these individuals to be able to evaluate them. Now, what you're gonna see that's very common in these individuals and should be seen in most individuals is that we're gonna see a corneal haze or a demarcation line in the cornea. Now, this happens because of keratocyte apoptosis because of the energy being applied. Now, the energy within the cornea, or excuse me, uh, in the energy that's applied to the cornea reduces about every 100 microns that we go into the cornea. So by the time we're at the 300 micron mark, uh, the, uh, the energy is not significant to cause any tissue damage or any issues there. But the keratocyte apoptosis that happens uh, clears the cornea of some of those keratocytes, and then we end up getting a repopulation of those keratocytes, which creates this haze. Now, over time, what's going to happen is this haze is going to reduce. And what this haze is really caused by is that there are uh, micro, uh, micro architecture uh, changes within the cornea, which then causes the light to scatter. So you can see the demarcation lines clearly here, uh, that little bit of haze in the anterior stroma. Now the clinical summary on all this is that generally all metrics such as visual acuity, keratometry, uh, K, specifically K-max, uh, pachymetry, and haze of the cornea are all generally worse than the one month mark, but then improve thereafter likely to baseline or better for these individuals. So the recap on this is that in corneal collagen cross-linking management, we want to define the clinical time course, discuss expectations that this procedure is to stop or slow the progression of the disease, not to improve visual acuity, and let the individual know that things are going to be about at their worst at the one-month mark, but should continue to improve from there. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into a couple cases. This case is a 16-year-old female with progressive keratoconus and uh, reports uh, progressive uh, decrease of visual acuity. And you can see that the individual is 20-20 on the right eye, 20-25 on the left, and you can see the frank keratoconus on the left eye with the early findings on the right eye. Now, what we do is we go ahead and say, we're going to do corneal collagen cross-linking, but the patient goes ahead and defers for a three-month period of time because they wanted to go on summer vacation and enjoy that. Uh, now, what we found was that the vision on the left eye had worsened over that period of time. At this point, that individual is now 26 minus on that eye and had rapid progression during that period of time. You can see the baseline scan in the center there. On the left, the uh, scan three months later, and on the right, the difference map, we can see that that individual had progressed five diopters within that three-month period of time, which really emphasizes the need to follow these individuals closely, especially when they're younger and at more high risk. Now, what we can see is that this individual had the cross-linking procedure at that three-month mark, but then was lost to follow-up for two years. When she returns to us, she's now an 18-year-old female getting ready to leave for college. She's noticed a difference in her visual acuity on the right eye. She's now 2020 minus, which is only a very small change, but she's very acutely aware based on the changes on her left eye. Now, what you'll also notice is that her visual acuity on manifest has improved on the left eye to 2025 minus. So we've had a little bit of an improvement there, and we'll talk about the changes to the corneal topography here. What we see is on the right eye, that individual has progressed. So you can see at the baseline scan here, and the three-month follow-up here, she's nice and stable. But at the two-year follow-up, that individual has progressed about two diopters. Whereas the individual's left eye, we can see where the baseline was, where she was three months later, five diopters steeper. After the corneal collagen cross-linking procedure, uh, we can see at the one-month mark at that follow-up, uh, before she was lost to follow-up, 
Uh, she was a little bit steeper than what she was before, as we would expect about a diopter after the uh, cross-linking procedure. And then at the two-month mark, she's flattened significantly, about three diopters of flattening within the central cornea. So if we go ahead and look at these scans side by side, you can see the untreated eye uh, has progressed about two and a half diopters. Then over here, we've actually had flattening of the keratometry of about three diopters, which is typical after the uh, keratoconic, uh, or excuse me, after the cross-linking procedure. So let's talk a little bit about contact lenses for keratoconus. Uh, there's a variety of different options for the keratoconic cornea these days, uh, which include everything from soft lenses all the way to sterile lenses. Now, the uh, modalities are great, so we should be able to find success with these contact lens modalities for these individuals. Now, to highlight the, uh, the importance of using these uh, specialty contact lenses to improve visual acuity, what we have is an individual with about a 70 diopter cone here, and you can see the tremendous amount of higher order aberrations in the central area, and you can see the distortion on the Hartman shack as well as the retro illumination of this eye. Now, when we put a lens on the eye, we can see that we've now smoothed the front curvature or the anterior curvature by masking it with the corneal, or excuse me, with the contact lens, in this case, a scleral lens, which gives us a nice even front curvature. And what that does is that reduces the higher order aberrations present going through the lens, and you can see the reduction in, uh, in distortion in the retro illumination as well as the heart shack, the Hartman shack. Now, when we look at this and give it a value here, we can see the higher order aberrations being present on the uh, lens, or excuse me, on the eye with the lens uh, absent as being about 6.5. And then with the lens on, we're able to dramatically reduce the amount of higher order aberrations present to about 0.8, which gave this individual a dramatic improvement in visual acuity. And you can see with the lower order ab uh, aberration correction, such as spectacle correction on the top, our uh, lower order aberration correction here is able to get us down to about the 20, 25, 20, 30 mark, which is very good for an individual with a 70 day after cone. Now at CLEI, what we did was a retrospective review of, uh, of our uh, keratoconic patients who have been successful in contact lenses, and we came up with the following algorithm that's pre-publication. And what we can see here is that we're looking at corneal topographies as, uh, or significant values in corneal topographies as being an IS value of 10 diopters, a Kmax value of uh, 55 diopters and a K-mean value of 50 diopters. If we're greater than those metrics, what we want to look at is scleral piggyback lenses for those individuals, whereas if we're less than that, we want to look at best corrected spectacle visual acuity of being uh, better or worse than 2030 to make our decision as to whether to go into a soft, uh, whether a standard soft or a custom soft lens, or going to an RGP or possibly a hybrid. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go through a case really quick here of uh, progression that was masked by a uh, contact lens and uh, tell you the importance of uh, checking these individuals' uh, curvature of their eyes by removing the lenses at every visit, okay? So this individual is a 23-year-old male, has had corneal, or excuse me, corneal collagen crosslinking in both eyes, uh, wears a scleral lens in both eyes, and has had stable visual acuity uh, since the previous visit with their contact lenses. But what we can see is on topography, on that left eye, we've actually had about two diopters of progression. So they're not gonna notice a visual acuity change with those small changes in uh, progression of those corneas, but that's significant enough for us to say, we need to watch this individual very closely and possibly repeat the corneal collagen crosslinking procedure for this individual. So you can see that little uh, change in the uh, keratometry value here, uh, with the baseline being in center and the, uh, that visit being on the left. So the lessons here are that we want to use our uh, contact lens, uh, excuse me, the lessons here are that the contact lenses can mask the progression of the disease, and we need to take the lens off to evaluate the topography, but we also want to know that progression can happen after the corneal collagen cross-linking procedure, so it's important to continue to monitor these patients often. So FDA-approved corneal collagen cross-linking is, is the standard of care, 
And what we're gonna do in summary is diagnose these individuals as early as possible, slower halt progression with corneal collagen cross-linking, visually rehabilitate these individuals with uh, specialty contact lenses or by surgical procedures that are a combination of the two, monitor these individuals often for change, and then leave our modern forms of corneal transplantation uh, to the treatment of last resort. And with that, thank you.